when the imagination ignites. You are pulled into either a world of the fantastic or a world of the dark and twisted. But not everything that is dark and twisted is fiction. And even old stories are based upon some truth. That truth gets recorded in the Pluto Archives. This was almost the worst day of my life. I shook my head to erase these thoughts as the door of the prison cell shut closed in my face with a clang. The smell of the six by eight foot cell was pungent, like a team of sweaty rugby players had left their dirty uniforms lying around. I turned around to view my surroundings and my new home for the foreseeable future. You get to be on top, a deep voice uttered to me from the darkness of the bottom bunk breaking my train of thought. This is not what you want to hear from your cellmate when you first enter prison. But I guess being on top is better than being on the bottom. I threw my stuff, which consisted of a blanket, a fitted sheet, a flattened pillow, onto the top bunk and proceeded to climb up, the bed frame creaking under my weight. I closed my eyes and leaned my head against the cool cinder block wall inside. <sighs> the sounds of the prison enveloping my ears. A giant hand touched my mattress as an equally large head came into view. What do they call you? He asked as he pulled himself up into a standing position. He was huge, the biggest guy I had ever seen, standing a full head taller than me. As he stood up, I realized he was the origin of the aroma that clung to all the surfaces of the cell. I was sure that I was going to smell like the rugby team sooner than later. Jack, I whispered. He handed me his large hand to shake in a sign of welcome, his hand eclipsing mine by twofold. I'm tiny. Nice to meet you. Despite his hand being so large and strong, he shook my hand gently, if not enthusiastically. What you in for? He spoke the dreaded question. Everyone always wants to know what you did to end up in the clink. It would be useless to tell him that I did not do it, that I was innocent. Nobody would believe me anyway, since all convicts say they are not guilty. I sat quiet and motionless, hoping that he would take the hint and slip back into the cover of darkness his bunk had afforded him. But he did not. He stood there patiently and waited for me to start my tale. Reluctantly, I began. The night was like any other night. I finished eating and decided to go to bed early. I had only just curled up in my bed and closed my eyes when I heard a loud noise coming from the back of the house, maybe the kitchen. I turned my head that direction, the direction of the sound, hoping to hear better. Glass was falling to the floor from the back door window as someone entered the house. I got up from my bed and slowly crept toward the sounds, careful not to inform the intruder of my presence, keeping my footsteps barely audible. I could hear the crunch of glass underneath the trespassers' feet as they strode towards the back stairs. I quickened my pace to head them off before they ascended the flight of steps that reached the second floor. When I reached the back door, the intruder was gone. Climbing the stairs two at a time, I followed quickly behind, trying to catch them before they reached Sadie, the love of my life. We met when we were young. She had beautiful blue eyes, golden silky hair, and always smelled of vanilla and lavender. She taught me about the best things in life, widened my culinary taste, and perfected my manners. I wouldn't be the person I am today if there was no Sadie. I reminisced about the girl who would forever have my heart. When I reached the second floor, the intruder had just burst through her bedroom door, and I could hear her scream of confusion and terror. I charged at her door, slamming my body against it over and over until the door finally gave way and presented me with admittance. Sadie was huddled in the corner with a baseball bat, a large man ominously coming at her with a sharp knife whose blade glistened in the moonlight, streaming into the room from the window. Run, Jack, run! She yelled at me. The man kept creeping toward her. Jack, run, please! The intruder? He looked at me sideways, but no alarmed expression was on his face. Nothing but an upward smile. The kind you see the cat make before he eats the mouse. I had never seen this man in my life. But here he was, standing over my Sadie with a weapon. I stood frozen in her doorway, screaming at the man to leave her alone. He didn't even look in my direction. It was like I was not even there. He took a step closer to her and stopped. Then he rubbed his finger perpendicular to the blade, showing us how sharp it really was. There was a long, pregnant pause of silence. Then he spoke. 
You don't remember me, do you? The rhetorical question was left out in the air. Sadie, not knowing if it was safe to respond, remained silent. The agitation in the intruder's voice was more evident. He asked again, You don't remember me, do you? Sadie shook her head no. The laugh that escaped his mouth was reminiscent of a lunatic stuck in a padded room. He took another step closer towards her. Sadie raised the bat in front of her, attempting to keep the trespasser at bay. He laughed and continued. Why is it girls like you always think that you're important? You think that you can treat everyone like they are below you. That you matter most and they mean nothing. Sadie was trying to keep all emotion from her expressions as she scanned the room for an escape route. The deranged man continued jabbering on about entitlement as the look of confusion started to grow on her face. The man took another step towards her. Sadie pulled her arms back in a batter stance and swung the bat with all of her might, thinking that this might be her only shot to catch the man unaware, providing enough distraction for her to flee. The sound of the cracking bat was defining as she hit him from across the side of his temple. His head swung to the right on impact as spittle escaped his mouth. Sadie lunged for the door while the invader was incapacitated, just reaching the threshold as he grabbed at her leg with his calloused hand causing her to fall to the carpet. He pulled her ankle and the body attached to it towards him, scraping her soft flesh across the rough floor. Sadie kicked wildly with her free leg, hoping that the movement would jar her imprisoned ankle from his grip, but to no avail. You're not getting away from me that easy. <laughs> the man sneered as he straddled her, pinning her to the ground. I stood frozen, not wanting to leave her and not knowing how to help her. The knife glinted again as he brought it close to her cheek. I could hear Sadie's heartbeat increasing rapidly. The man leaned and whispered into Sadie's ear, I'm so glad I have your undivided attention now. She tried to wiggle and throw the intruder off of her, but his size alone was no match and she ceased her exertion. Then as a last resort, she started screaming, a blood curdling call for help. You see, he said, no one can hear you. I made sure of that. I made sure that we would not be disturbed. With his words, the atmosphere changed and her fear became palpable. I was not the only one to recognize this. So did the man. And he beamed at this revelation. In a flash, the knife that the man had been holding slid against her right cheek, causing a thick line of blood to form on the skin. The light scent of blood combining with the fragrance of fear. Sadie let out a small whimper at the pain. The man leaned down again, breathing deep, smelling her new scent. Then his tongue touched the side of her face that had been marred by the blade and licked up the blood that was pooling there. She tried to move her head against his assault, but she was trapped and all she could smell was his hot, sweaty breath. By the aroma that was leaving his mouth, she realized that some of his foul breath was caused by alcohol probably the liquid courage he needed to carry out his plan. The man touched the other side of her cheek that had not been disfigured yet. So soft. Your skin is so soft. Do you remember where you know me from yet? Sadie looked up at him clueless, trying to place his face somewhere. Tisk, tisk, tisk. That's a bad girl. Am I that forgettable? I'll bet you don't forget me after this. The knife sliced into the other side of her face deeper this time, causing the blood to run down her cheek instead of pooling. A wince escaped from Sadie as he made the incision. Then tell me. She breathed, trying to manage the pain and fear that consumed her. Tell me how we know each other. I I'm forgetful. This answer seemed to satisfy the man, and he continued. It was about ten years ago. You and I were at Camp Kinnebac together. Sadie strained to remember who this man was sitting on top of her, brandishing a knife. You were a camp counselor and I was a camper. My parents leave me there all summer knowing that I hated the outdoors, knowing that I had no friends. They eventually got their comeuppance. His eyes twinkled at this memory as it resurfaced. Sadie had been a camp counselor for four years. There were tons of boys like that, boys that were loners. They did not do well at that camp. I was upset my parents didn't show up for the end of the season production, nor did they even pick me up on the last day. You, however, dried my tears and drove me home. 
With those last words, the look of recognition flashed across Sadie's eyes. See? You do know me. The look on his face was triumphant. Why are you doing this? I was only ever nice to you. The man was starting to get agitated with her statement. Why? Why? You have to ask why? The mentally unstable part of his personality was coming to the surface with his increasing agitation. Because when I asked you to go to the prom with me, you said I was too young. And I should find someone my own age to ask. But you see, no one would go with me. I was too scrawny. Nobody wants to go with a geek. After that night, I vowed I would make everyone pay who made me feel small and unimportant. I started working and devising my plan. I know you're a good person at heart. Just let me go and I will not tell anyone this happened. It will be our secret. You don't want to do this. Oh yes. Yes, I do. The intruder smiled down at her as his knife cut slowly into the flesh exposed on her neck, stopping her scream from escaping her throat. At this moment, I knew I needed to help her. It was now or never. Regardless of my fear, I launched myself at the man screaming and thrashing. I caught his ear between my teeth and bit down with all of my might. He threw me against the wall with brute force, knocking me unconscious, but not before I swallowed the piece of his ear that I had bitten off. When I came to, I was in a holding cell, waiting to come here. They had already decided that I was guilty of Sadie's murder, so there was no reason to argue otherwise. The shock and heartbreak overtaking me, oh. I could hear them talking in hushed voices about how her body was brutally dismembered and staged throughout the house. They even found her decapitated head in the freezer in the kitchen. One detective said it was the most brutal killing he had ever seen, that whoever had done this should get the death penalty and at least burn in hell. Ah! But you see, I was in hell. My Sadie was gone because I was too cowardly to help her until it was too late. I put my head in my hands and began to weep quietly, signaling that my story had concluded. Tiny, the ever active listener, patted my leg in supposed comfort. He never commented on my gruesome tale, but quietly returned to the shadows of his bunk, giving me the privacy to grieve. I had only shared the cell with Tiny for three days when a guard approached. Yeah, uh, I need you both to stand against the wall with your hands behind your head. I looked at Tiny questioningly as he stood up and we took our places against the cold cement. He did not understand what was going on either, but urged me to follow the guard's commands. I did reluctantly. Another guard was standing behind the first guard and entered the cell and proceeded to place handcuffs on my wrist and shackles on my ankles. The cold metal felt obtrusive on my warm skin, preventing any large movements. They escorted me out of the cell. The look of worry was evident on Tiny's face. I wanted to say something to reassure him, but no words left my mouth as I was escorted away. Another missed opportunity. I followed the guard silently, asking no questions. It did not matter to me what my fate was. I felt I was responsible for Sadie's demise. The smell of vanilla and lavender reached my nose, and I perked up. I would know that scent anywhere. I dreamed of that fragrance, Sadie smell. Then I stopped abruptly, as the stench of sweat, blood, and alcohol mixed with her aroma. The guards were yelling at me to keep moving, but I was busy in my own contemplation to give them my attention. They pulled me forward gruffly into the room with the conflicting smells. Yeah, that's him. That voice. I knew I had heard that voice before. It was telling Sadie that she was not going to get away that easily. That was the same trespasser that first cut Sadie and then licked her blood off her face, causing her true fear. This man that was standing across the room was the same person that had tortured, decapitated, and who knows what else to his love, his Sadie. That man was the reason for all his heartache and despair. He waited patiently as the man moved closer and the guards removed his shackles. Once free, Jack lunged at the murderer, trying to match with physical damage the emotional mutilation that the intruder had already caused him. But within a blink of an eye, the choke collar was already around his neck. Aren't you a good boy? 
the man preened as he scratched Jack's ears. A deep growl escaped Jack's mouth, putting his pearly whites on display. Uh, I'm not sure if he's ready to be adopted, one of the guards declared. You see, he was a really sad story, and he won't let anyone near him but this giant Rottweiler. The guard took a step closer to Jack, reaching for the leash to take him back. The man smiled and put up his hand. Nah, he's perfect. And for the trouble, I will give you twice the adoption fee. With the thought of the extra funds to feed more animals, the guards acquiesced to the intruder's request for Jack. Come on, Jackie. Let's go home. The man announced, dragging Jack to the door. As they left the pound, he knelt and whispered into the dog's ear. I have a great movie you might like to watch. It stars somebody you know. If you have enjoyed our podcast, please let us know by liking, subscribing, and telling all your friends. See you next time on the Pluto Archives. This story was written by A.D. Morris. Narrated by Kevin Morris. Produced and directed by Noah J. Morris. This has been a Puka production.